A bit of rivalry or war between Indian and Harley Davidson began in 1903. In this doco, I will attempt to dissect it and showcase it as never before. Indian has had somewhat of a management roller coaster ride over the years, while Harley's management has remained much more stable. Indian got the jump on Harley by two years when in 1901, founders George Handy and Carl Oscar Hedstrom teamed up in Springfield, Massachusetts to make a motorcycle together. This bike later became known as the Camelback, for an obvious reason. It was a 260cc single cylinder four stroke and produced two horsepower with a top speed of 30 miles an hour. Production started in 1902. Harley was never too far behind when in 1903 Harley Davidson was founded in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and they began to make a prototype. Production of their Model 1 began in 1905. This first Harley was a 405cc single and produced 3 horsepower with a top speed of 35 miles per hour. Not only did this first Harley look more like a proper motorcycle rather than a bicycle with an engine like the Indian of the same year, it performed better. Incidentally, an aunt of the Davidson brothers named Janet hand painted the words Harley Davidson on the gas tanks of the very first bikes that they produced. In 1905, Indian began building their first V-twin, but these weren't available to the public until 1907. 1908 saw the 440cc Model 4 from Harley, which produced 4 horsepower with a top speed of 40 miles an hour. This was the first year that the iconic grey paint with red pinstripes was used. This paint scheme and the quiet motors led to many different Harley models in later years being nicknamed the Silent Grey Fellow. The Indian of the same year, although it was a 5 horsepower V-twin with a top speed of 45 miles per hour, still more resembled a bicycle. Harley wasn't too far behind Indian when they released their first V-twin, the 810cc Model D in 1909, which produced 7 horsepower. And just to be clear, neither Indian nor Harley invented the V-twin engine. It was actually invented in Europe. But the same year, Indian motorcycle pioneered their new loop frame, which was similar to the frame that Harley was already using, which is ironic considering previously Indian had accused Harley Davidson of stealing their carburetor design, and they sued him, but Harley ended up winning the case. Anyway, the 1909 Indian V-Twin had a displacement of 623 cc's, and although it wasn't as powerful as Harley's 5D producing just 5 horsepower, it was much lighter and far superior to the Model D, which often broke down. Due to this, the 5D wasn't a sales success for Harley, and it was taken off the market until 1911, when they introduced a very much improved version of the V-Twin Model D. Indian was quick to realise that success on the racetrack was important to sales growth. They were the first American factory to field a racing team, predating Harley's famous wrecking crew by at least five years. It was also the first American brand to compete internationally, visiting the Isle of Man in 1909. Indian rider Lee Evans finished second that year. Indians were the most technically advanced motorcycles of the day. At a time when most bikes still used direct drive leather belts with variable pulleys, Indian's chain drive and two-speed transmission were cutting edge and a huge advantage for racing. In 1911, Indian racing boss Oscar Hedstrom entered five bikes in the 1911 Isle of Man TT, the first year motorcycles raced over the entire circuit. Three riders were factory riders, but Indian also supported two privateers, including Oliver Godfrey pictured here. He won the TT that year. In fact, Indian finished first, second and third in 1911. By 1913, Indian was the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world, with production being almost 32,000 machines. 1913 was also the year that Oscar Hedstrom left Indian. The same year, Harley Davidson built a brand new factory, and their production in 1914 soared to over 16,000 motorcycles. They were slowly but surely catching up with Indian. In 1915, Harley released the Model 11F. It featured an overhead valve V-twin 1000cc engine, but only the intake valve was overhead. It produced 11 horsepower and had a top speed of around 60 miles an hour. It also had a proper three-speed transmission, leading link front suspension, electric lighting which incorporated tail light that could be removed for a service light, and also an automatic mechanical oiler. This bike was by far Harley Davidson's best motorcycle to date. However, the Indian of the same year produced 15 horsepower, and the Indian had another significant improvement over the Harley, 
they done away with the previous pedal crank system and replaced it with a much more user-friendly kick-starting mechanism, making them look less like a moped and more like the motorcycle that we all love today. In fact, Indian actually invented an electric starter for motorcycles in 1914. However, it was only a one-year option as battery technology at that time wasn't up to the task. In 1916, Indian introduced the Power Plus, the Power Plus produced 16 horsepower with a top speed of 70 miles an hour. It was the best motorcycle in America and probably the world at that time. In 1916, George Hendy also resigned from Indian. Harley's Model 16F of the same year was a great bike too, but it just wasn't in the same league as the Indian Power Plus. Meanwhile, the racing competition on the motodrome board track at the time between Indian and Harley Davidson was utterly fierce. <laughs> Factory sponsored races were expected to be loyal, and it was pretty unheard of for riders to switch allegiances without controversy, but it did happen, with the most notable one being the legendary Shrimp Burns, who rode for Harley Davidson in 1919 but signed with Indian for the 1920 season. This just added to the ill feelings between the two companies even more. There were indeed two camps of riders in those days, and they didn't mingle. Racing on these steeply banked tracks was extremely dangerous. The injuries received were horrendous, from hundreds of splinters to broken bones and many riders and spectators lost their lives. It is officially the most deadly form of motorcycle sport ever devised. This led to the circuits being nicknamed murder drones, suicide sources or the bowl of death. The worst accident on record was in 1912 when eight people lost their lives. In 1920, Indian introduced the first Scout, a middleweight 596cc V-twin which produced 11 horsepower with a top speed of 55 miles an hour. Designed by Charles B. Franklin, who was recruited to the engineering department in 1916, Franklin wasn't only a motorcycle designer, but a racer of considerable ability. This original Scout proved to be very popular, and it was one of Indian's most important models. It was also light and agile, which made it attractive to new riders. Harley's equivalent at that time was the Model W, or more commonly known as the Sport Twin a 584cc flat twin which produced just 6 horsepower and a top speed of 50 miles an hour. Although it was a good bike, it never sold well against a similar in size and faster Indian. The Indian Scout was later fully reworked from the ground up in 1928 to become one of Indian's most famous bikes of all time, the 101 Scout. 1922 saw the introduction of the very first Indian Chief of 1000ccs, also designed by Franklin. This was Indian's first big bike, and it was not intended to be an agile sports bike so much as a touring bike and a sidecar hauler. It didn't take Indian long to decide that a 1000cc engine wasn't big enough. So in 1923, they enlarged the engine to a whopping 1212ccs which produced 24 horsepower, with a top speed of 85 miles an hour, and they called it the Big Chief. Both the Chiefs sold alongside each other until 1928. The big Harley at the time was a model JD, which was 1208cc and produced 18 horsepower. Indian purchased the Ace Motor Corporation in 1927, and they began producing their inline four cylinder bike as the Indian Ace 4, later named the Indian 4, which was designed by Arthur Lemon, the former chief at Ace, who was now employed by Indian. The four cylinder had an engine capacity of 1265cc and produced 30 horsepower, with a top speed of 95 miles an hour. The Indian Chief retained its place at the top of the size and desirability charts, it just shared the glory with the Indian 4. But in 1929, Harley Davidson released their JDH, better known as the Toucan. It was the fastest road bike the company had up until this time, and likely the fastest bike on the road period. Its 1208cc engine produced 29 horsepower, and being lighter than both the large Indians, it soon earned a lasting reputation for its power and acceleration and with some fine tuning, it was capable of 100 miles an hour. The bike featured new twin bullet headlights and a front brake was also added. By 1930, the Great Depression had an immediate effect and Indian's rollercoaster ride of management changes continued. They merged with DuPont Motors, 
who stopped making cars completely to concentrate on making Indians. Harley-Davidson was much more stable, with all four of the founders continuing to work for Harley-Davidson right up until their deaths. With all their success early on, Indians soon began a slow descent stemming from the changes in ownership and management in previous years. The DuPont strategy to save the company was to rationalise the product line and build all models essentially using the same frame. This meant that the light and agile Indian scouts suffered and sales were at best disappointing. They remedied this in 1934 with the introduction of the Sports Scout. It was just what enthusiasts and racers had been crying out for, and it was one of Indian's most successful models. With an engine capacity of 745 cc's, it produced 25 horsepower and a top speed of 85 miles an hour. But Harley had the 1212 cc VLD with 36 horsepower and a similar top speed, and production numbers of the Indian Chiefs at the time were so low they were barely to be seen. Just two years later, Harley-Davidson introduced its all-new overhead valve 988cc EL knucklehead with a four-speed constant meshed gearbox. But they rushed to get the bike into production and it suffered teething problems, including oil leaks and difficult starting. The knucklehead engine featured a much more modern recirculating oil system with a two-stage oil pump, whereas previous Harleys run on a total loss lubrication system, this upgrade meant they could build an engine with a higher compression. The result was 40 horsepower. The instrument panel on the EL was mounted on the gas tank and it was the first Harley to have a speedometer as standard equipment. The 1936 knucklehead was a beautiful motorcycle. Everything from the knuckles deeply balanced fenders to its spring of forks and high mounted headlight all came together to create a timeless classic looking motorcycle. In 1940, the all new Indian Chief was introduced with the trademark deeply skirted over Lance fenders. It's safe to say that this feature is the first image that comes to mind when anyone thinks of an Indian motorcycle. It is truly an iconic motorcycle that has gone down in history. It also featured plunger rear suspension. At this time, all Harleys still had a rigid rear end. In fact, Harley-Davidson didn't introduce rear suspension on any of their bikes until 12 years later. The Chief was a 42 degree V-twin of 1210 cc's and produced near on 40 horsepower giving the huge bike a top speed of 85 miles per hour. The Chief was an ideal touring machine for the wide open roads and with lots of torque it could easily carry two riders for very long distances. The Indian Model 440 of the same year was also given the same treatment, which led to it being described as a Cadillac on two wheels because the bike offered such a smooth ride. After the war for 1946, Indian upgraded their Chief and girder style front forks were adopted which had 5 inches of travel as opposed to the meagre 2 inches allowed by the previous leaf springs. The rear still featured the same plunger type suspension but the spring rates were softened. These changes resulted in an even smoother ride than before, a notable selling feature of the post-war Indians. 1946 was the year the iconic Indian head fender light or war bonnet was introduced as well. Harley-Davidson's chief engineer, William Harley, died during the war in 1943, but still, Harley was able to bring out a new model in 1948, the model FL, with their brand new panhead engine. It was available in 988 cc's or 1213 cc's. It featured alloy heads and hydraulic valve lifters, which reduced the engine noise. It produced 50 horsepower. Just one year later, hydraulic telescopic forks replaced the spring of front end. While Harley normally used just letters and numbers for its models, this was the first time that they copied Indian and began to name their bikes as well. In 1950, the Indian Chief was fitted with a whopping 1300cc engine for even more power. Hydraulic telescopic forks replaced the spring of front end. Unfortunately, these Chiefs were too expensive to build and the Chief was discontinued at the end of 1953 and Indian went bankrupt. Ralph B. Rogers purchased a part of Indian in 1945 and DuPont gave Rogers control over Indian. Rogers cancelled the Scout and the Indian 4 in favour of cheaper lighter weight motorcycles. Many Indian riders were irate that there was no V-twin Scout for sale after the war and unfortunately for Indian, this was the beginning of the end. Even though the bikes didn't sell all that well, they still come up with some great names. In the coming years, numerous attempts to use the Indian brand name were attempted but all proved unsuccessful. After 1953, the brand was scooped up by the British firm Brockhouse Engineering, who was a major shareholder at the time. 
they began importing British-built Royal Enfields and rebadged them as Indians to sell them in America. This was met with disgust by traditionalists and sales were very poor. They even had the nerve to call this 1959 model the Indian Chief. This was ill-fated and it ended in 1960 and Brockhouse sold the Indian company to Associated Motorcycles, or AMC, a parent company who owned Matchless, Norton, AJS, Francis Barnett and James Motorcycle Brands in Britain. But AMC itself ran into serious financial problems in 1962 and the Indian name fell into disuse. Mr Indian himself, Sam Pearce, the man who gave Bert Munro so much assistance, and who at one time had the world's largest Indian dealership, even he had a crack at making some Indians using his huge stock of new spare parts, assembling them and adding some special bodywork and performance upgrades. He called this 1968 one the Indian Super Scout. Enter Floyd Clymer, of Clymer Repair Manual fame, and he continued along a similar road, selling rebadged Royal Enfields as well as importing Italian source minibikes and selling them all branded as Indians apparently without acquiring any legal rights to the Indian trademark. He even made an Indian Bella Set 500 in 1970. With an Italian frame, an English engine and an American name, it was truly a very exotic cocktail. When Clyman died in 1970, his wife sold the alleged Indian rights to his attorney, Alan Newman. And then he continued to sell the small capacity motorcycles branded with the Indian name as well. He even started up his own factory in Taiwan, sourcing mainly Italian two-stroke engines he did this right up until 1976, but when sales declined, he too bowed out. Crikey, that's a lot to take in, eh? Anyway, back to Harley Davidson. After Indian's demise in 1953, there was really no competition left for Harley in America, but they had no equivalent to the lightweight and relatively high performance British bikes of the 1950s, and quickly found itself at a disadvantage. Enter the XL Sportster of 1957 with its lighter weight and more compact size. Its 883cc V-twin motor used four cams to drive the overhead valves and it produced 40 horsepower. But within two years, the Sportster engine was producing 55 horsepower and it had a top speed of 115 miles an hour. 1958 was another good year for Harley Davidson with the introduction of the Duo Glide, rated one of the best bikes of all time. Supremely comfortable, with updates such as swing arm rear suspension and hydraulic rear brake, its 1213cc engine produced 55 horsepower. It is such a beautiful motorcycle and has probably been used in more movies than any other motorcycle in history. This bike came to be loved by many. Harley continued to make some great motorcycles during the 1960s, including their very first model with an electric start, the famous Electroglide of 1965. There's more information on this model in my groundbreaking motorcycles video. Then, in 1966, they introduced the new shovel head motor. However, this new engine was not without its share of problems. They leaked oil and they also burnt oil. Low oil levels combined with some overheating problems sometimes led to complete engine failures. These problems cost Harley a lot, while the Japanese bikes at the time were gaining in popularity. In 1969, American Machine and Foundry better known as AMF, bought the financially struggling Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Company. This was the very first time that Harley-Davidson wasn't under the control of a family member, and it wasn't long before it showed. They restructured production and reduced the workforce for cost savings. This approach led to strikes and lower quality. Many motorcycles were failing the final inspection, and they were then used for donors for foldy bikes. While some of their bikes were still very good, because of the issues with the shovelhead motor and the poor quality at the time, I'm afraid there are no gold stars for this period. Harley-Davidson were always a company that took note of what riders were doing to their own bikes, and during this turbulent period, they still made some important motorcycles, like their very first factory custom in 1971, the FX Superglide. However, sales were poor. Ah, oh, crap! They continued to make the necessary modifications to improve on the shovelhead engine, but it was plagued with problems and it wasn't until 1980 that they had addressed all of the issues. This is when they took the factory custom idea many steps further and unveiled the FXWG Wide Glide, which was basically a chopper straight out of the factory. It featured a raked front end with longer forks, forward controls, pull back handlebars, a step seat and a bobbed rear fender which completed the look. Then there was also this bike, 
the 1980 FXB Sturgis. In 1981, a group of 13 Harley Davidson executives, including Willie G. Davison, the grandson of company co-founder William A. Davison, purchased the company back from AMF. The new owners reinvigorated the company and hugely boosted company morale. In 1984, Harley unveiled their brand new 1340cc Evolution V-Twin. 80 cubic inch Harley Davidson Evolution engine. It won acclaim for its simplicity, ease of maintenance and reliability. 1988 saw the introduction of the soft tail Springer with a look that has for a long time inspired the custom bike culture. It was a modern bike with the looks of a simpler era. The new chrome Springer front end was reminiscent of those used before hydraulic forks were introduced in 1949. This retro looking front end matched well with the soft tail frame, with its twin shocks hidden underneath the engine to give the look of an old time rigid bike. Power for the soft tail Springer was a new 1340cc Evolution engine introduced in 1984, which produced 56 horsepower, giving the bike a top speed of around 110 miles an hour. On the road, the Springer gives the true classic Harley look and feel of decades past. The solid mountain engine rumbles and vibrates in typical Harley fashion. 1990 saw the release of one of Harley Davidson's most iconic and best-selling motorcycles of all time, the Fat Boy. Three design features that were prominent on the Fat Boy were the solid riveted 16-inch disc wheels, the shotgun exhaust and the FL-style front forks. There's not much else you can say about the Fat Boy, other than it is a truly awesome motorcycle. In 1998, nine companies joined forces to create the IMCA, the Indian Motorcycle Company of America in Gilroy, California, and they sold Indian brand motorcycles that were again made in America. Initially, they used the very reliable s, &S engines of 1,442 cc's, which produced 75 horsepower. Although this bike was adored, and it is very beautiful, they were under a court order to develop a propriety engine for the 2002 model. They called this new 1600cc engine the Power Plus, but the engine proved very unreliable and ultimately contributed to the company's bankruptcy in 2003, ending yet another chapter of Indian motorcycle history. Ironically, the same year they ceased production was Harley Davidson's 100th anniversary, and with all the models that Harley Davidson had on offer at the time, including their stunning totally new muscle bike the V-Rod, which was introduced in 2001 and produced 115 horsepower with a top speed of over 125 miles an hour, it was always going to be a hard job for Indian to compete. In 2006, Stelican Limited, a British company, acquired the Indian trademark rights and successfully restarted the brand once again, manufacturing and selling completely new designed Indians in Kings Mountain, North Carolina from 2009 onwards. The 2009 Indian Chief incorporated a totally redesigned and improved 1720cc Power Plus V-Twin engine with electronic fuel injection. The all new Indian Chiefs were assembled by highly skilled two man teams. The frame and all the parts were electro coated for enhanced corrosion protection. Other features included a six speed transmission, belt drive, four piston Brembo brakes, and by all reports, this bike was simply awe inspiring to ride. In 2011, Polaris Industries purchased Indian Motorcycle and production facilities were moved to Spirit Lake, Iowa. In 2013, Indian unveiled their brand new 111 cubic inch Thunderstroke engine. And what an engine it is. It is a true testament to the Indian legacy. Over a century later, these two giants of American motorcycling are still battling it out right now. And while we all knew who would win in the end, there wasn't that much in it. Even so, it was interesting to look at the many mishaps which could have led to the downfall of both brands, but in true American spirit, they have survived. I'm sorry if your favourite model or ride wasn't mentioned, but I just couldn't mention them all, otherwise this doco would be like 24 hours long and nobody would watch it. Anyway, nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed it. I for one hope both these iconic brands continue to produce motorcycles for many years to come. Cheers.